Welcome to episode nine of Ask the Grounding Experts, where our experts from ENS Grounding Solutions answer your engineering questions about the world of grounding and earthing. Today, our engineering guru, Mr. David Stocken, picks up where he left off last week as he covers part two of a two-part series answering the question, what is the four-point soil resistivity test? Yeah, so this is uh, going to be part two of our soil resistivity test. And what we're going to talk about today is instead of uh, what how the test is performed or, or what it does, more uh, about um, how do we plan it and what is the purpose of this test? What do we want to see when we're uh, doing a soil resistivity test for a grounding and earthing system? So the primary goal of this is we, we want to start when we plan out and decide how to do a four-point soil resistivity test is what is the size of our electrode system that we're trying to design and build for? So take, for example, a substation. And let's uh, say we have a substation that's 100 feet by 100 feet, right, in size. Uh, that substation, the diagonal distance from corner to corner of that substation is going to be roughly 140-ish feet, right? 141 feet across from corner to corner, right? That is our substation sphere of influence, right? If you recall from our previous videos on sphere of influence, that determines the size and, and the area of soil that's going to be utilized by that grounding system to dissipate electrical energy into. That means that that 100 by 100 grid is going to be utilizing soil 140 feet down into the earth, right? So we really want to make sure we have at least soundings, at least to that depth, so that we understand what's going on because that's going to impact our grounding system. You know, we don't want to take readings only down to, say, 100 feet because what if down at 120 it all of a sudden turns to solid rock and we have a massive current um, uh, bounce that comes off as the electricity enters the earth, it goes down, hits that layer of rock down there and bounces back up on our system. It could dramatically change our step and touch voltage calculations in our substation. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that our what we call the A spacings, that's the distance between our probes, is equal to at least the size of our grounding system that we're uh, doing the measurements for, right? So in this case, we're designing this 100 by 100 substation grid. So that's 141 feet. We want to be out there, probably have spacings at least 150 feet in spacing. So we'd have a probe at zero, another probe at 150, you know, one at 300 and another one at 450 feet. So we'd have a 450 feet linear distance across the earth. We're injecting current at zero and 450 and measuring the voltage drop at 150 and 300 to get a sounding or a measurement down approximately to 150 feet in depth. And then we want to shrink those readings down and get slices in between each one. Turns out we want to have slices that are at an interval of about 1.5 in order to effectively do the math that we need to do later in order to calculate out what those layers are. What do I mean by a 1.5 interval? So if we took a 10 foot reading and then we get a reading, a measurement at 10 feet and then we extend our probes out, we go to 20 feet spacings. Now we have a 10 foot sounding and a 20 foot sounding. Well, that's doubling. Right? We doubled our distance, and that's too great for our mathematics to do the calculation. It needs a 15-foot reading in order to do the math properly. Right? Uh, by the way, for my engineers out there, feel free to look up IEEE Standard 81 Annex B, and you can see the interpolation mathematics in that. Um, you'll see very quickly why we use a computer to do that math in order to figure this out. Uh, it's very complex and sometimes it can take millions of calculations in order to get this uh, figured out properly. The, uh, uh, so you want to make sure that you're not only do you have a big enough A spacing, but that you have a properly planned 
A spacings that are smaller so that you get the right intervals so that you can do the math appropriately. And you want to have readings uh, that go very small so that you also get the top layers of the surface of the earth. We tend to start at six inches spacing. So we'll have a probe at zero, six inches, one foot, one and a half foot. And then we extend out from there all the way out to our uh, our, our final result measurement that we want to take based on our size of our system and we go out in increments no greater than 1.5 intervals right so take that number six inches and we just keep expanding it out so that we stay within that nice tight interval and make sure that we get enough uh, data points for the computer to properly do the mathematics on it now um, in an ideal scenario it, when you know uh, just because you get down to 150 feet that's really not always ideal that only gives us an accuracy of about 50 percent or so right and again if we look in IEEE standard 81 we'll actually see a chart and what they really want us to do is go three times deeper than we're trying to measure out to so on the, in this 100 by 100 grid that means we need to go down about 150 feet we really want to be down there at about 450 foot depth we want a sounding there if we really want to get the accuracy up into the upper 90 percent range of being able to accurately calculate step and touch and resistance to ground calculations so that means we really want to have a probe at zero another one at you know, 500, 1,000, and 1,500. You're talking 500 foot spacings or 1,500 feet out. And taking soundings down 500 feet into the earth, if we really want to have a good, accurate understanding of what's going on with this 100 by 100 foot substation, it is not unusual to get a soil resistivity test with 1,500 foot spacings. Uh, where each probe is 1,500 foot apart and we're pressing current through there. This requires very high powered meters, sometimes with thousands of volts and pumping hundreds of amps of current into the ground. It can be very dangerous and needs to be handled very properly if we're going to get the, uh, uh, so no one gets hurt. You know, these are currents and amperages at uh, levels on these meters that are enough to kill someone if they don't know what they're doing so you definitely want to have a firm that knows what they're doing and how to properly handle and how to properly to help you design these test plans for making sure you get the data you need in order to accurately calculate out the resistance to grounds step and touch calculations for your substation as you keep people safe and and that your designs are in compliance with IEEE standard 80 and 29 CFR 1910.269 and of course all the European standards as well who have equivalent requirements as we do here in the states for keeping people safe in high voltage environments. Yeah. So uh, this should help you uh, understand why sometimes we have uh, a winter four point testing at different spaces. It depends on the size of your grounding system, is the primary driving factor for what we want to do with the winter four point test so that we get the most accurate results in our final calculations for human safety. And uh, that should conclude uh, our part two of this uh, winter test. Thank you guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a quick like down below and subscribe to stay up to date on future educational videos we will be publishing. And feel free to post questions or comments below as well. We might even feature your questions in future videos. If you want to learn more about the amazing world of electrical engineering and grounding, be sure to check out our certified online courses at the links in the description below to kickstart your career. We'll see you next time.